My name is Sean Atwood. I survived the toughest jail in America and it set my life in a whole new path. I started out as a stockbroker in 1991. By 96, 97, I was investing in rave parties and distributing ex the rave scene had such a massive effect on me when I was at university. It became my religion. I pledged that when I made a million in America, I was going to transfer that scene to Arizona. It took me five years to be bringing in half a million a year. I began to invest in the party ideas and then the trafficking followed on from that. As I got increasingly into and raves my numbers on the board started to decrease and both of those worlds commenced to collide i recall being in the car park and i was counting a load of cash and the boss's secretary got in the car next to me and saw me just counting all of this cash and my boss called me into his office the next day and he said sean you're at a crossroads in your life right now whereby you can stay on the path of your slow and steady progress or you can go down here his eyes went really big as if there was a hell down below i didn't want to be working those long hours anymore because of that fatal decision I lost absolutely everything. So I'm at my peak. I'm thinking I'm above the law. We're joking. The cops will never catch us. We're smarter than the cops. We're like characters out of movies like Pulp Fiction. The party's never going to end. But if you watch any movie, the trajectory is always the same. It starts out with the glitz and the glamour and the initial drug use. But every time you take the side effects are increasing in the background. You're always chasing those early highs. And it gets to the points where you're mixing your up, you're taking harder and people are getting paranoid and starting to lose their minds. It's only going to end in the prison, police, death or the mental hospital. Things were getting so out of control that I realized it was a good time to quit. I met a woman, I fell in love with a woman and she taught me out of the importation and also a lawyer who advised me on legal matters to do with the enterprise. He said that they were onto me, the cops were onto me, I needed to stop. I thought I got away with it. I thought the cops had to catch me. I was naive to the statute of limitations in Arizona. It's seven years whereby all it takes is someone from your past to tell the cops that they did a deal with you and they've got you. So I thought I was going to live happily ever after with Claudia. And then I wake up one morning, I'm on my computer looking at the stock market very early. And all of a sudden, boom, 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 boom on the door. Go to the people. It's blacked out. I'm wondering, is it cops or people pretending to be cops coming to rob me? Look through the window. Entire complex is surrounded. SWAT team. Go through to the bedroom. We're like, what should we do? Because we can hear bang, 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 bang. Tempe Police Department, open the door, we got a warrant. All right, we better let him in. We get halfway through the living room and then just boom. Door just flies off the hinges. Hands above your heads, get on the ground now, don't move. And the detective, after we got crushed and handcuffed, the detective just hoisted me up and got in my face. And he's like, English Sean, we finally got you. And he just laughed in my face. As the detective laughed in my face, I turned to Claudia and started yelling, I'm exercising my right to remain silent, love. I'm exercising my right to remain silent, love. And they were like, shut up. And they grabbed me, escorted me down the outdoor stairs, basically, in my boxer shorts. Right away, they assigned serious offender status on me, which carries 25 to life, plus my initial dozen charges. If they stacked all them at 10 years each, carried 100 years. But it was in the second year when they doubled my bail bond to... 1.5 million dollars cash only and doubled my charges so that I was facing a maximum 200 years all right so i'm in the jail for 26 months before my sentencing and arriving at the sheriff joe arpaio's house of horrors the horseshoe madison street jail you go in there and this little old lady's at this plexiglass window and she's like have you got any lice have you got any herpes have you got this have you got that and you're like no 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 then they take your belt off you they take your shoelaces off you so you can't hang yourself and you go through this subterranean lot of cells in a horseshoe shape so when i got assigned to medium security the skinheads come up to me right away neo-nazis aryan brotherhood and they're like hey we want a word with you get in that cell over there and you can't say no to them or they're just going to smash your head into the wall so go into the cell they come in behind me, close the door, so I'm trapped. Biggest one gets in my face. He's like, what are your charges? What are your charges? My charges are like crime syndicate, continuous criminal enterprise, conspiracy. I don't understand what all this stuff means. So I say to them, I don't know what my charges mean. That is not a good answer. Now they've got me up against the wall about to attack me. What do you mean you don't know what your charges mean? 
are you a chomo are you a chomo i don't even know what a chomo is at this point so i'm like these guys are gonna kill me chomo is child molester some charges are kos by the gang kill on sight such as pedophile stuff other charges are sos smash on site beat up such as drive by shootings because women and kids sometimes get hit anyone coming in with a defense crime against a woman or a child right away gang is going to try and murder them or at the very least they're going to attack them that's called convict justice in the end i pull out my charge sheet they see i'm in for that's acceptable. They see my bail bond is $750,000 cash only. They love that. One of them's like, are you guys the mafia? Who did you guys kill? I'm like, no, it was just raves. We didn't kill anybody. And one of them said, yeah, well, I killed someone at a rave. I was on the GHB and I, I just stabbed this guy, blah, blah, blah. I was like, holy shit, this guy doesn't like ravers. <laughs> so this is probably not the right answer. But anyway, they told me that I stunk because I've been in the horseshoe for days and there's all these rules. And one of them is if you don't get a shower, they beat you up. If you go sitting at the tables of the other races, they beat you up for that. If you go talking to the guards, they think you're snitching, they beat you up for that. And on and on and on it goes. So they explained all the rules to me so I won't get smashed and told me to go and have a shower because I stunk. But pretty quickly, I saw them handing out some convict justice. So there was a guy they suspected was a child molester and the guards tip him off as well. That's how they find out who child molesters are. And sometimes child molesters just get into the general population and this person had and they got him in the shower and they're just kicking the living daylights out of him. This guy's curled up in the fetal position and he's in, in this bloody mess and they all mad out of the shower like you know like they're proud of themselves well then this big guy with cobwebs tattooed on his neck says how come we can still hear him because the guy was whimpering and they're all oh, we smashed him good and he's like not good enough dog and he just goes into the shower all casually grabs the guy's head and it's like he's trying to break open a coconut crack 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 now this guy looks dead guards do security walks about every 30 minutes so 30 minutes in you hear lockdown everybody lockdown go back to your cells so we all locked down you see all the guards rushing into the shower and medical people i had to get used to it nearly every day someone was getting smashed there are various stages of adaptation to incarceration when you first go in you've got the shock on your face of the newly incarcerated and the gang members would come up to me and say look you got to get that look off your face or else you're going to get preyed on everything you think about in your everyday life i'm going to see my girlfriend tonight what we're going to have to eat i'm going to watch something on netflix it's all out of the window this is just raw survival i'm now getting used to the sounds of heads getting bashed against toilets bodies getting thrown around like they're sacks of potatoes seeing people's teeth fly out blood everywhere in cells six months in i've witnessed or heard so much of this i've got this face on me now where i'm not showing any emotion at all and it's called dead eyes and most prisoners get that because any sign of weakness will be exploited so i've gone from the shock of the newly incarcerated to adjusting to prison life and then you go to just trying to make the most of it by developing a routine my lowest moment in prison was in the second year. They doubled my bail to 1.5 million and moved me to maximum security. They'd indicted my girlfriend for a prescription pill found in our cabinet that didn't have a written prescription right next to it, which is class six felony. Co-defendants can't visit co-defendants. They told me I was facing a maximum 200 year sentence. They gave a guy who had a similar case to me, they offered him a 15 year plea bargain, he refused and they gave him the 200. So I knew it was a credible threat. It was at that point, I'm living with the cockroaches. My body is covered in bed sores and rashes and I'm itchy because of the heat. So I'm living with the cockroaches. I'm covered in skin infections and bed sores. I've got this pink eye infection. My eyelid is down here and there's yellow pus coming up my eyeball. They've stopped my girlfriend from visiting me. They've told me I'm facing 200 years. And I'm thinking 200 years, I just can't take this anymore. So I decided to kill myself after a guard did a security walk and before I was going to kill myself though. I wanted to say goodbye to my family, to my mum, my dad, my girlfriend, my sister. And what I mean by that was well, just to have a look at their photos. I was allowed seven photos in the jail and I'm looking at the photos and I'm thinking, your mum's going to get a call in about an hour when they discover your corpse and they're going to tell your mum her son has just killed himself in a foreign prison. And to be honest, I started crying at that point. And you can't let people see you crying in prison either. I just basically get a book and turn towards the wall and, and, and uh, yeah, but that's what saved my life was was looking at the photos of my mum, my dad, girlfriend and my sister and the thought that they would find out and how it would affect their lives. I ended up serving just under six years 
on my nine and a half year sentence. And by the end of it, the prisoners said, I turned my cell into an office. I had this blog that was online, John's Jail Journal. My parents would send the printouts to my cell. I was writing about all the different prisoners I was housed with, some, a, a, a select group of them. It was like Christmas. They'd all pile into my cell and they'd be reading the blog comments. One guy, two Tonys, multiple homicide, mafia murderer, he was serving over 140 years. He'd be reading the comments, he'd be like, Sean, I never imagined that you know, a school teacher out of Singapore could ask me questions about my mafia life. I never imagined that this could possibly happen. I just thought I was going to die in here and never have any communication with the outside world. So this blog, John's Jail Journal, became a bridge to the outside world, not just for me, but for also for the other prisoners that I was writing about. I managed to get after six years on my nine and a half year sentence because we got a loophole lawyer that was recommended to me by the New Mexican Mafia. So I had a relationship with the New Mexican Mafia before I went to prison. They said, if you ever get in any serious trouble, this is the guy you need to call. So because I was a first time non-violent drug offender who was not a US citizen, he got me what's called a half-time release on the balance of my sentence. So I had 26 months back time from being on remand unsentenced. And then I got half time on the balance of that sentence. So that's how I got out after, si or just under six years. It was December, 2007 when I was got released. So I had to get released to a deportation facility. Then they took me to this facility. So we got on a plane on Connor, you're all chained up with all the other prisoners. You can't get up and use the toilet. There's federal marshals watching you with guns. And then the next day, I get called out to get taken to the airport. Get to the airport and I said, I need to pee. And he's like, look, I'll take you through to, to the toilet. I'll chain you to something while I have a pee. Don't try anything funny. But then, then I have to watch you have a pee for security purposes. So we did all that. And then he says, right, we're going to put you on the plane first so you don't scare the passengers. And I'm welcomed by this cabin crew from London and it was the first time people had just spoke to me like I was a person not I was a number and my heart just melted just to be talked to like I was a person all the passengers are getting on you know, I can smell the women's perfume after being around these sweaty men for six years and they ask a female member of the cabin crew can I go you know where's the toilet can I use the toilet and she's like yeah you don't need to ask it's just her and I'm going bright red so I'm still excited I've not slept for days and then we landed at the airport I just breezed through. I thought they might want to have a word with me. The authorities in the UK I breezed through. And there's actual video footage on YouTube of me hugging my mum. And I'm all stubbled out. And I'm, I look sh completely shell-shocked, like I've been through something quite intense. And there's a video of us where my sister's we're in the car now from the airport. She's showing me her phone and she's tell explaining to me what texting is. And then they took me for Indian food. Now, because of the dead rats in the jail food, I um, got the gag reflex when I ordered my favorite meal, chicken tikka masala. In the jail, they had this meal called Red Death, which occasionally had dead rat in it. Eating the chicken tikka masala reminded me of that. And to this day, I've, I got the gag reflex. And to this day, I've, I've remained vegetarian. I discovered yoga and meditation. I've maintained that and that's, you know, Initially, when I got out, I was having flashbacks, I was having nightmares, and I credit the yoga and the meditation with getting that down. When I got released into London, I did some BBC interviews. Over the years, I started to do over 100 talks a year. I've spoke to hundreds of thousands of students now, and it's so cool, you know, when you get messages from them years later. One kid, she was so inspired, she went on to do a criminology degree, and her parents invited me to the graduation, and I had a meal with them. When the teachers tell me the kids who stayed behind to ask me these questions are the hardest to reach students, and telling the story is therapeutic for me, seeing the positive effect it has on society, because I regret the harm I cause society. I regret the harm I cause my family members and loved ones. If you think you're gonna get away with crime in this era of modern technology, you're delusional. The tech that the cops have, you probably can't even comprehend it. If you think you can send a message on a phone and delete it and it's never gonna get retrieved, think again. The cops put a net bus Trojan horse in my computer, which showed them everywhere I had the money. And the day of the SWAT team, raid all that money was gone and that was 20 years ago can you imagine what the cops can do now if you're tempted by the fast cash of transactions think about this there's gonna come a hell of a price when you lose years and years of your life not only that the loss of mental health and well-being of your loved ones your family members your parents because when the cops bust you, they're going to take every single thing that you've got. Not only are they going to take everything you've made illegally, 
they're going to take everything we made legally as well. So my entire pension I made as a stockbroker was gone. My life savings was gone. All the money I had in the bank was gone. All the money I put in accounts, people have flown over from England was gone. And then you're going to lose years and years of your life. So it's better to just stay on the straight and narrow, have a normal straight job and let that money add up over time. You're going to be worth a lot more in the long run because that fast cash is an illusion. So my end goal is to keep raising awareness about the prison industrial complex, the horrors of mass incarceration of low level users and the scam this is on the taxpayers. $60,000 a year of taxpayers money per person. So they went after the lowest hanging fruit to arrest young people with and the highest arrest category was possession at the peak of the war. It's almost a million arrests a year for possession. The government knows prohibition doesn't work. They know that from alcohol prohibition, but they continue it because of these tens of billions of profits. It doesn't matter which political party wins. They kick down tens of millions in political con contributions each year to keep the contracts rolling out. And it's obscene that someone who's arrested with... I mean, prisons are designed to house people who hurt other people. If you arrest a kid with who's that kid hurting? Then they become a neo-Nazi. They get onto hard drugs, which is heroin. They get hepatitis C. They've got a criminal record. Their lives are ruined. All for what? So these evil enterprises can make money. If you are a young person out there, I hope you take from this a couple of lessons, including stay on the slow and steady progress track in life. I had that goal of being a millionaire by the time of 30, and I was sidetracked by the fast cash of trafficking. But because of that fatal decision, I lost absolutely everything. If you've got a goal at your age and you stay on that path, perseverance will get you there. The other lesson is if you've got an addictive adrenaline junkie personality like me, channel that energy into positive activity. When you, that side of you starts to kick in, put this circuit breaker in your brain. Remember to channel that energy into positive activity. So ask yourself out of all your interests, what are the positive ones? that are going to prevent that from happening. Sports is great. Sports causes the brain chemicals, the endorphins to cascade, just like it does, but you're not going to get visited by a SWAT team. Don't repeat the stupid mistakes I made. Thanks for watching.